How's everyone doing? It's Sunday in your church. Come on. So good to see all of you here today. I want to welcome you here and those of you that are watching online to Venia Church. Venia means grace, and here at Venia we share God's grace by loving people because God accepts us as we are, and He sees the potential of who we can be. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's Word changes lives, and so today we're going to be in the book of Daniel, and we'll be in chapter 6. And I want to talk to you this morning about the jealousy that can well up in others as they see you have success in your walk with Jesus. It's a natural thing that will take place. Uh, As you and I have learned several lessons just in this book of Daniel, we've learned things like making sure that we get our information from God. Uh, as we seek counsel, as we seek to learn how to do things in life or what we should do in any given situation, God's Word has everything we need. Uh, so we've learned to, to get our direction from His Word. Uh, we've learned in this book so far to believe that God is who He says He is, to believe that when God says He will do something, He will do it. Uh, We've learned to remember Him in our lives, uh, in every situation that comes up. When we're being a husband, when we're being a wife, when we're being a parent, when we're being an employee, uh, when we're writing out our checks for our bills every month, in everything that we do, uh, we remember the Lord. Uh, We've learned to let our light shine into this world, to be bright for the Lord, and that light is so attractive to others. Uh, As people see that light in us, they can become jealous. Uh, We've learned to stand tall, even in the face of adversity, even when uh, the world might not agree with what we're doing for the Lord, we've learned to stand tall. We've learned to grow intellectually, to grow spiritually, and like I said, as we do these things, as we are successful in our Christian walk, others will see it and others will want it. Listen to this. God said in Exodus chapter 20, he tells tells us this, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or, and pay attention to this closely, anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Anything else. Now, this is the 10th commandment that God gives us. Do not covet. Now, for those of you who don't know what coveting is, coveting is having a strong desire to have that which belongs to another, uh, to the point where you don't even want them to have it. If you can't have it, you don't want them to have it. It's a very uh, bad thing for that to happen in our lives. It's a form of jealousy. And God says, don't be jealous of, don't covet your neighbor's wife, servant, donkey, any, anything else, their position, don't covet their abilities, their looks, their charisma, their success. And I can tell you, when somebody is jealous of you, you can tell. You notice when somebody else is jealous. Maybe you share with them a success that you've had in your life. Maybe you had a promotion at work because you've been doing a good job. Maybe you got a pay raise. Maybe you got engaged. Maybe uh, you have some great achievement that your kids have done. And you start to share that with people. And there's this silent pause. There's, There's not an immediate reaction of, wow, that's so awesome. I'm so happy for you. It's just you tell them and they're like, oh. And they might even give you a, a courtesy, well, you know, that's good for you. That, that's, that's, that's awesome, you know, good. Hey, that's great, you know, but there's no real enthusiasm. They're jealous of what's going on in your life. And they can even stop making eye contact with you. Um, it, it, jealousy is a terrible thing. They may even try to tear you down. Oh, you got a promotion? Oh, you got a pay raise? Well, maybe, maybe now you can afford some good shoes. You know, they just start to, to tear you down. They don't like that you've got this success. Sometimes jealous people will become completely competitive, overly competitive. You know, you just had a baby and all the focus is on you, and they go out right away and get pregnant just because they, they don't want you to have any attention on you, and so now they're trying to get the attention on themselves. Maybe you and your spouse or you and your boyfriend or girlfriend just went out to Sizzler, 
and they have to go out and make a reservation to Morton's. You know, they're just trying to one-up you every step of the way. Sometimes the pouting and the angry words and the competition aren't enough. They may even begin to deliberately sabotage your success. I know of men and I know of women who have deliberately, when they see the success in somebody else's marriage, they have deliberately gone and tried to seduce one of the members of that marriage. They, a, a, a woman may see a, a marriage is good and she'll go after that man. A man may see a marriage is good and he goes after the woman, trying to tear them apart because of the jealousy. And it's something that happens in them. And you ask them, why would you do this? They say, well, their marriage was so great. And I was so jealous. And I thought, There's not, it's just not fair that they have that and I don't. And so I went after that. I've had people confess these types of things to me. Jealousy is a terrible thing. When you find yourself following after the Lord, when you find yourself having success in the things that we've been talking about, people will see it. And sometimes people will grow jealous. What does that look like? Well, let's find out today in the message entitled, the Tenth Commandment. As we continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Daniel, now if you're here for the first time, we're happy you're here. Thank you for joining us. We're in the book of Daniel right now. This book has life lessons. We've talked about a few of them already. Uh, These life lessons, if you apply them to your life, you will find success in your Christian walk. Uh, If you are not a Christian, uh, we're glad you're here. Some of this won't make sense to you, but trust me, the Bible is full of things that if you will listen to what God says, even though it might not make sense to you, and you apply these things to your life, you'll find that God will start to bless you with his presence in your life. Um, Another thing about the book of Daniel is it's prophetic, meaning it talks about things that are in the future. Some of these things have already come to pass. Uh, Some of these things, if you just open up a newspaper, you will find that these things are happening. These, These prophetic things are taking place, unfolding before our very eyes. Now, last week we talked about the fall of Babylon, uh, the Babylonian Empire, and the death of King Belshazzar, and we talked about what to do with what we know, and how there's accountability as you start to know certain things. You are now held accountable to those things. If you missed last week, go to venia.tv forward slash sermons, and you can check out the past sermons there. But today, uh, we're going to find that the Medo-Persian Empire is now the one that's in control, and there's new leadership. Anytime you have new leadership, when there's a turnover in leadership, what you're going to find is there will now be some sort of restructure within the organization. The one who's now in charge is going to restructure things to work the way they want them to work, to benefit them. And you'll find that in every type of organization, whether it be a family, whether it be a company, a church, and certainly a nation. Anytime there's a change in the leadership and a change in the structure, you will find that people want to restructure things to work out the way they want them to work out. I remember as a young man working for a company, And this company bought another company, and as this company was purchased, they brought their employees into our company, and now they were a part of our company. So as we're there working together, you could just watch. I mean, I could step back and just see what was happening, and people were jockeying for position. People were starting to tear people down. I mean, they they were jealous of, this guy already knows that guy, and so he's got a leg up, and they were trying to work the system to benefit themselves the most. And I think we can all relate to that on some level or another. Maybe you've gone through a company buyout or something like that, or maybe you're part of a a blended family where two families come together and now there's different leadership and different expectations. Things get restructured. Um, When that takes place, it can be uncomfortable. Uh, And so let's Take a look as we open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to see a restructure, uh, restructuring taking place here in Babylon, what was Babylon and is now the Medo-Persians. Uh, take a look at verse 1. It says that it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. 
And so this restructure is beginning. Darius takes 120 people and puts them up in all the different regions. And the purpose of this is for them to run things the way Darius wants and to collect taxes and bring them into the empire so that way they'll continue to be strong. And what we'll see in verse 2 is that with these 120 satraps, he places three governors of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Now Daniel, by this time, Daniel's in his 80s. I mean, he's an old guy. He's done a lot in his life, but he's kind of in semi-retirement. You know, you think about it, it's kind of a weird thing to be in semi-retirement when you're in your 80s. But he was still doing some things, but he was just kind of not on the, the mainstream of politics. He was kind of enjoying his older years, and now he's sucked back in to mainstream politics. And of course, he was sucked back into this. I mean, Daniel had an above-reproach character. The guy lived an amazing life to please God, and somebody like this would be appealing to a new king uh, who doesn't know who he can trust, and he knows he's just hearing different stories, and hey, there's this guy, he's old, but he's always been above reproach, he's never gotten in any trouble, there's no scandal to this man's life. Uh, If he lived today, he would not have lost any emails. Um, Some of you watch the news. Uh, He will not have lost any of his emails. There would be no pictures of him with women that weren't his wife. There would be no sexual scandals. There would be nothing wrong with this man's life. He lived a life that was good and pleasing to God. Uh, And so for somebody who, you know, I mean, they're looking here, Darius is looking for a way to make sure he doesn't suffer any loss. In other words, nobody's stealing from him. So Daniel would be the right person for the job. And in verse 3, just like we've seen time and time again, Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps. His lifestyle was better than theirs because an excellent spirit was with him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. In other words, okay, so I got Daniel and these other guys, and they're over 120 guys, and he says, no, I'm going to take Daniel and put him even above them. I'm going to put him in control of everything. And so just like you and me today, when we live our lives to please God, when we do the things we know is going to bring glory and honor to Him, there will be something appealing about this. People are going to see your marriage. People are going to see your children. People are going to see how you do your finances. People are going to see how you respond to the tough things in life. And when they see that you're doing it in a way that brings glory to God, they're going to They're going to be attracted to that, and in some way they will be jealous of that. Godly lifestyle will open the door of opportunity in your life. Notice in verse 4, though, that the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. These men were nervous about their livelihood. Why? Because of the skim. I mean, these men, as they collected taxes, they would just skim some off the top. They would line their own pockets. They would make sure their houses were big and beautiful, and they had plenty of servants and the best food. And so they were stealing money that they were supposed to give to the kingdom. Now, Darius knew that this was going on. This is why he appointed people to try to watch over these people that were doing that. Uh, And so they knew that with Daniel, if he was to be put in this high position, if Daniel was there, they weren't going to be able to skim the top anymore. They weren't going to be able to cheat the system. Daniel has been continually just built up and built up and built up because of his lifestyle. And now they're jealous because they want his position. They know that they're going to end up losing out. Now, does this remind you of anyone? As you read the Bible, you will find that the very same thing happened to Jesus. You had the high priestly family. The high priestly family, their job in the temple was to make sure that the temple business was going well. Uh, 
one of the things that would happen in the temple business is people would come and they, if they had Roman money, uh, Roman currency, they would have to change that currency into to Jewish currency so that way they could buy things on the temple mount. And so when they would change it from the Roman currency to Hebrew currency, the people were ripping them off. They were charging them absorbent amounts. Jesus knew this, that these people were making their pockets fat by stealing from people that just wanted to worship God. So what did Jesus do? Jesus fashioned a whip at a court. He comes in and he just starts whipping everyone, whipping them out, knocking over the table, saying, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. In other words, you're stealing from God's people. Knock it off. And these high priestly people knew that Jesus had done that. And so what do you think they did? Just like Daniel, they're going to seek to get rid of him. He's threatened their livelihood. Matthew chapter 26 tells us this, that inside the leading priest and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. But even though they found many who agreed to give false witness, they could not use anyone's testimony. They couldn't use anyone's testimony. Daniel and Jesus led a life, of course, Jesus did, he was perfect, but they led a life that was above reproach, so much so that false testimony wouldn't work. You can't lie, I mean, you can't say that that Jesus committed sin, they knew, I mean, he lived a life of perfection, and same thing with Daniel, I mean, Daniel's living his life above reproach, gone, he's in his 80s now, and the any false witness would beg the question, why do you think Daniel would do that? I mean, it's just ridiculous if they would come up with some lie about Daniel. He's in his 80s. He's lived his life this long by not, not you know, working against the government and not working against God. He's done things right. His life has been good. And you, know, you try to blame him of something now, it wouldn't make sense. Nobody would buy it. And so in Daniel's case, they sought to pin him against his relationship with God. Notice in verse 5 that these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Daniel's life was a godly life. He was a godly man, and they wanted to use that against him. And in the case of Jesus, he is God and spoke of having the ability of God, and so they were going to use that against him. We read in Matthew 26, verse 60, that finally two men came forward who declared, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in just three days. So if somebody were to say that today, they were going to destroy the temple, people would say, hey, there's a bomb threat on the temple. Uh, But we know that Jesus wasn't referring to that physical temple. He was referring to the temple of his body, that he was going to be murdered, he was going to be buried, and in three days he would rise again in glory. So he was speaking of his resurrection. But when people become jealous of you for being godly, they're going to use anything they can to make accusation against you. And certainly this was the case for Daniel. And so verse 6, these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. Now notice this. All the governors, all of them, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And so there's a lie in their proposal to King Darius. They said all of the governors, every, all these people in control, they've all come together, they all agree. All of them? Where's Daniel in this? Not all of them. They're lying to this guy, and what they're doing is they're appealing to his vanity. They're they're trusting that this man would be so vain that that he would buy into this right away and that he would want this type of worship for himself. They were jealous of Daniel, and they would do whatever they could to tear Daniel down. And so now they're banking on the vanity of this king. And they plead with the king in verse 8. 
to establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Remember, the head of gold, the absolute monarchy, has now been changed to the arms and the chest of silver. Now you've got uh, a monarch still, but the monarch now is mixed with a form of constitutional law. And so this king, he could pass law, but now these laws that he passed were now applicable to himself. He couldn't break his own laws. Uh, And so therefore, since he's going to give in to his vanity, we read in verse 9 that King Darius signed the written decree. All of this took place because people were jealous of the life of Daniel. And you can just imagine the cry of Daniel. You can imagine what he's thinking. You can have this too. This life I've lived, pleasing God, this life that other people see the life I've lived and they've lifted me up to this high position, you can have it just the same. That's what Daniel would tell them. If you would just honor God, if you would just seek to please Him, stop seeking to please yourself, life isn't all about you, it's about honoring a holy God, if you'll just do that, you can have what I have. Why do you got to tear me down for it? You can have it too. Well, there's no doubt that as you apply the principles of God's Word in your life, there's going to be good fruit. Good things are naturally going to happen as you apply God's Word to your life. It's just that simple. And I'm telling you, as you do that, as you have success in the Lord, some people are going to be jealous of you. It's just going to happen. They're going to want what you have sometimes to the point where they don't want you to have it if they can't. Let me just tell you, we need to learn as Christians, if we're going to have success in God, we're going to need to learn how to deal with the jealousy in others. And so let me just give you three things this morning to consider as you deal with jealous people. First of all, when dealing with jealous people, don't engage them. Don't engage them. So what you're saying, Pastor Tim, is just ignore them. Yep, just ignore them. You don't have to engage them if that's the kind of activity. If they're trying to tear you down and they're being overly competitive with you and they're, they're doing these things out of jealousy because they don't want you to have the success that you're having, don't engage them. Don't. We don't need to. Next week when we come together, we're going to read about Daniel and what he did in this case. And he didn't engage them. He didn't try to fight with them. He didn't try to argue with them. He didn't try to say, why are you doing this? This is ridiculous. I didn't do anything. You guys are just jealous. He didn't engage them. What did Daniel do? We'll find next week that he just goes home. He goes home and he prays. In other words, he just went on with his Christian life. He went on doing what pleases God. Knowing that, hey, God wants me to pray. I'm going to just go home and pray. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I don't care what anyone else on this earth is doing. My life is to please God. I'm going to continue doing what God's called me to do. That's what we do. We see the same principle in the life of Jesus as he's standing there before the high priest. Matthew 26 He's standing there in front of the high priest. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? What do you have to say for yourself? And what does Jesus do? Remain silent. He just stood there. Didn't engage him. Didn't fight with him. Could have killed him like that, but he didn't. He just stood there, silent. He's showing us, don't engage these people when they're trying to tear you down. Let God take care of it. Let God do it. Use your time. Use your energy. Use your resources. Use your talents on other things besides engaging people that are stricken with jealousy. Second thing you can do as you're dealing with jealous people is don't stoop. Don't stoop to their level. Never, ever, ever stoop to their level. When they're engaging you verbally, trying to tear you down, don't stoop to their level. They're like, you're fat. Don't come back at them saying, well, I can lose weight, but you can't fix ugly. (laughs) I mean, we're not supposed to do tit for tat here. We're not supposed to be getting back at them. We're not supposed to stoop to their level. 
We don't need to get physical with other people. We don't need to become overly competitive with them and try to one-up them when they're trying to one-up us. The point is, two wrongs don't make a right. Let them do what they're doing, and you just be concerned about your walk with the Lord. That's why God tells us in Romans chapter 12, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, capital M. This is saying that vengeance is God's. I will repay, he says. He says, look, don't go and try to avenge yourself. I got this. I know what I'm doing. I'm God. Let me be God. Just trust me. I will avenge you. And it's not our time. Sometimes we we may feel like David. As you read the Psalms, you can just hear the cry of David for vengeance. He's like, Lord, how long are my enemies going to come after me? Why don't you do something already, Lord? Don't you see what I'm going through? You can read it time and time again. The heart of David, he's just frustrated at everything that's happening. He's like, God, do something. And then he always comes back around to, nevertheless, okay, you're God. You, you know what you're doing. Your ways are perfect. He always comes back to that. God, your time is perfect. You know when to do this. Vengeance is not ours. The timing is not ours. The Lord even showed us that, that the timing is for the Lord. Notice in Matthew 26, it says this, that the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, you have said it. And in the future, not right now, because it's not the Father's timing, but in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Oh, there's going to come a point in time where your knee is going to bow, your tongue's going to confess that I am Lord, he says. There's going to come a point in time. Believe me, he says. But it's in the future. It's the Father's timing. Oftentimes when there's vengeance to be had, we want it now. We're like, God, take over. Zap them, Lord. And he's like, listen, just I I got my timing. It's perfect. Just just relax. I can can take care of it. Finally, when you're dealing with jealous people, remember the coals. Remember the coals. Simply return their bad behavior with good behavior. When they put down your shoes, tell them how beautiful their dress is. When they're down in the dumps, ask them if you can buy them lunch. When they go to Morton's after you went to Sizzler, just ask them how the seared sea scallops or Rossini tasted. You know, just build them up. Let them feel good about themselves. The point is, you need to be looking for what God's looking for. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, you have to be after what God is after. He's always after reconciliation. He's always after building people up and and making relationships right. That's what he's about. You want to, you're going to have an enemy. He knows what we should be doing. The point is, you need to look for that restoration. That's why we're reminded in Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? In other words, since vengeance is God, his timing, he's perfect. He knows what to do with vengeance. Leave that up to him. Because of that, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, A lot of people read that and at face value, they're like, yes, if I just kill them with kindness, if I'm nice, I'm going to put burning coals on their head, it's going to burn them, I'm just, I'm going to be as nice as I can, and it's going to suck for that person, yes. That's not what that verse is about. It just defeats, that's why God says, listen, vengeance is mine, so if your point of being nice is to burn their head, you're trying to get vengeance by being nice, it defeats the purpose. It's not the heart of God. Here's what that means. As you study the the culture in which this verse was written, at night you would keep your family warm. You would build a fire in your stove and towards the end of the night that fire would be burning down. It would be real hot. You'd have those hot coals in your stove. Now if you had a neighbor who was traveling a far distance and they just got home, they didn't have a fire in their home. 
what they would do is they would come by your home and knock on your door and they would tell you that they just got back from their journey and they had no fire in their home. And so you would take a pot and you would go to your stove and take some of the hot coals and put those hot coals into this clay pot. And you would give them that clay pot full of hot coals and they would put that on their head. And now as they traveled from their house over, or from your house over to their house, their head would be warm. They would bring those coals into their home and they would start a fire from those coals in their home. They would now have warmth in their home. They would now have some of what you have in their home. That's the point God's trying to make. It's not that you're going to burn their head. It's that you take some of what you have and you Give it to them in an effort to bless them, to bless their home. That's the heart of God. If they're jealous of what you have, give them some of it. Bless them with it. Build them up. Let them know, hey, you're jealous of my relationship with my wife because I'm doing what God wants me to do. Let me tell you how to do this. Let me show you what God says. I want to build you up. I want to I better your life through God's word. God is always, always after reconciliation. Now, my prayer as we close this morning, my prayer for you guys, for our church family, is this. My prayer is that people would be jealous of you. My prayer is that people would try to tear you down because of how well your life is going. My, my prayer is that people would be overly competitive with you. My prayer is that people would so desperately want what you have that they're trying to just rip you off. That might sound weird, but seriously, I'm just hoping and I'm praying that when people see your life, they go, gosh, I, just, I want that. I want that type of marriage. I want that type of family. I want that type of work ethic. I want that type of you know, way of handling hard things in my life. That family's so good. They just have a way of getting through things so effortless, effortlessly, however you say that word. I want that. That means you're having success in your walk. That's what I want, and so that's what I'm going to pray for right now. Let's pray.